Welcome everyone for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing today. The topic of today is Lecture 3, Parallelization Fundamentals. So in the last lectures, we really learned already some practicalities of having really MPI. And then before we introduced ourselves a little bit to high performance computing systems, which are often use MPI applications or OpenMP shared memory applications. And today it's even hybrid these days. And the shared memory will come a little bit later because there's one thing that we a little bit missed when we were going forward with high performance computing architectures, multi-core, many-core chips on the one hand, and then also thinking about directly programming with MPI. And of course, this is relevant for your assignment. So the next steps really is now to think about what means parallel? What is parallel computing? Why are we doing this? What are the benefits for it? and what are kind of fundamental paradigms in that that I want to achieve. With this, it will be a very conceptual lecture today. But before we dive into the material of today's lecture, let us a little bit look what we learned the last time. And the practical lecture 2.1 was already very much, uh, you know, the skill set that you require for your first assignment. It was covering the message passing interface and really the key concepts of it. We learned that essentially MPI can be any other C program and they have to augment some of the different, let's say, uh, functions which are predefined in the MPI um, header and in the MPI library here. So, and we learned there are different ways how you can use MPI. And one of the key differentiators in terms of communication is really point to point communication versus the collective communication. So when we then actually look back how this really now is implemented, we started a little bit with the hello world and then moved over to this ping pong of really having this point to point communication saying I have an MPI sent that I gave out and the benefit of doing so is I can always determine who I am. And this, of course, if you think about the ping and the pong, which is essentially demonstrated on the top here, where basically the ping is shown every processor needs another processor to be ready to receive the ping, right? So this is an important part in MPI. When you do an MPI send, you need a matching receive. And the matching receive is, of course, in another rank, another processor. If you remember, we had many examples where we really try to understand that MPI com world gives us a group of all processors. And inside these processors, uh, there are unique identifiers which we can use to really influence the program flow of our application because in the end what we all have with these applications it's single program multiple data so the same program runs on all the different processor cores however we can always differentiate between basically those processors um, where it matters of having you know basically one up to the amount of processors minus one we also learned then, of course, for more subsequent and advanced applications, you can create groups. The groups then, you know, have their own communicators, have different ranks and so on. Um, but this is something where we will come back to when we have subsequent lectures. Now, again, when we look now on the point to point communication, we said this is kind of really easy to understand. You have a send. But however, you have to prepare the buffer also to receive. That's what we had in the source code here when we think about that um, essentially something should go over the wire. And of course, this was just the ping that you also see here, and which is just these lines, right? The MPI send, receive, matching, receive. We also said we want to send back a pong. So essentially now we switch roles. We say essentially that the rank zero who is initially was sending is now receiving. And the one that was first receiving is now sending. For this, I have to change a little bit the kind of area where I want to go with this. So I have to define the destination, which is now our rank zero. And basically, we used a little bit the tag to identify then when we made the output that this was the same, let's say, communication. So everything was went smoothly. And if you remember, also the stat here was basically used to fill with the MPI get count here some information of um, what was really going essentially in the MPI send and receive 
over the wire? Was there really something happening? And this is a very trivial example where we essentially then have um, just an X going in and out, um, a ping and a pong. However, there were two processes involved. And we also learned with this that essentially you don't program for a precise fixed amount of cores. This might be a very specific one where you kind of uh, think about the ping pong program, essentially just have two processors. But the last part of the lecture was also more and more alluding to the collective communication. We had the broadcast, the first one here, which ships the same data to many other processors, basically by just performing one operation, but including all the other processes defined in a communicator. So basically in these collective operations, I don't need to do the destination and source like in point-to-point -point communication. Here I rather, in, I'm completely in the space of the MPI COM world, so in the communicators, or of course of those that I have already defined. In other words, when I do here an MPI broadcast on from rank zero as a source, it will basically provide the data to all the others basically inside this communicator. And the same is true for the other collective operations. However, we then finalize the lecture a little bit on a couple of practical issues. So we have seen the C program is always a valid MPI program and we use a C compiler still augmented here with MPI code. And we run it on the scheduler and we learned that there are different ways how in practice we should basically do this. And one of the key terms was really the wall time. So we learned that if you want to maybe simulate the boat here and it's basically on the ocean and you know happily simulating all the, all the way, we need to have some time limit because otherwise maybe the application will run forever and blocks everyone other to be part of this. On the other hand, we learned that the scheduler really needs this information to really plan ahead a little bit about how the multi-user schedule will really look like. And with this, we learned something like when you define this in your job script, what we could do, and your application maybe needs more time. We actually faked this a little bit with the sleep command, but here, of course, this should stand for a sailing boat sailing along the ocean, maybe twice around Iceland. So there is a certain period in time where the scheduler says, okay, you ask for half an hour, even if your sailing boat wants to simulate it for two hours, I don't care, I am the scheduler, I have the power to actually stop your job. <clears throat> That's what we have seen basically in the output of the job, there was really a message directly in a way from the scheduler daemon saying, uh, this job was basically stopped because we basically had the wall limit uh, reached. And in basically, let's say uh, from the practice, we call that it, the job was running against the wall, right? So you have, should have specified essentially more time uh, for the simulation that you had. But of course, this is a tricky thing. So usually students ask, uh, so how do I know how many you know minutes this will take or hours? Of course, there's a kind of experience in this. Uh, researchers use incredibly often the same simulations. They change parameters. They change maybe the do domain decomposition, things we learn today. But the, with the one way, they get a more feeling to it. So they know much more from previous runs. Okay, is it four hours or just 40 minutes. So with this, there are several policies we didn't discuss in the practice as well. So there are different cues for long running jobs and some of them which are really then helping the scheduler to, to maintain a good schedule on all of these systems. But this will be going too far for an introduction lecture here right now. We've come back to this in later lectures when we have large applications. So let's come then today to our next step in the conceptual developments. It's something we left behind a little bit to really understand what parallel computing means and how can I measure it? And what are the technologies which are really enabling this, which is again, multi-core, many core in one way or another. And then of course, having many of those together in clusters and HPC systems. So we will really have from a bottom up a parallelization perspective uh, in order to really understand what the benefits are. And then at the end of the lecture coming more to more conceptual theoretical aspects of it, but they enable us to really understand what speed up means. So the structure of today's lecture is really think about common strategies for parallelization. So we will still pick you up what you learned in lecture one already with multi-core and many-core, inherent parallelism there, different ways how to do it, but then how we explore and leverage this, basically, if you want to do some scientific or engineering computing. 
And this will be also, of course, something we come back when we have the application track towards the end of the course, starting with lecture 10, when we then more and more dive into really applications. Here we think about different aspects like halo and ghost layers in simulation sciences, but also in the data sciences. We had already this idea of saying SPMD, single program, multiple data, but there are also other ideas of parallelization when you basically have this MPMD, we're saying multiple program, multiple data. So we will reveal this a little bit. And along the way, we really think about that it's not only about computing, also it's about data. So we always have to think about the data parallelism aspects of it, or do we think more about the functional parallelism? Once we have established that, and always we have some applications in context, also I brought here and so there some videos to really understand a bit more deeper what we're doing there and also how it relates to common, let's say, terminologies that you should know. And, and one of it is really the Moore's Law. And this will be really the kickoff of the second part where we think about that the number of transistors was always growing, the performance was incredibly enhanced in all the normal CPUs already, but then we learned it was too hot for the CPU, so they invented the many core systems, and we will look a little bit behind Moore's law. So then uh, in the end, we will see with this, there is some certain amount of parallelization that today is not only in this Moore's law eminent by having more GPUs today, but also to think about that this kind of speed up is always limited if you have one processor, right? No matter how good the GPU is, no matter how good the CPU is and how many transistors they will have, we also do parallelization in a larger scale, not on one CPU or GPU only. We really want to understand what happens if I apply different processes to one problem. And by this, there's a certain term and complexity introduced. One of this is, of course, we want to have some sort of a speed up. A speed up refers a little bit to when I apply four processors, I want that the time to basically the solution is reduced. And this sounds pretty easy. You just divide everything by, let's say, four, if you have four processes, and it should be simple to compute. But we will also reveal that this is actually not the case. We start with some toy problems where this might be not an issue. But as you grow with the scalability, you have load imbalance, maybe also in the data sciences, uh, very eminent. You always not have the same let's say, distribution of data over the domain. We will see also how that materializes when we look in one of the clustering algorithms. And then, of course, we'll reveal a little bit the role of the serial elements we have when we do scalability, which means there are certain things which really hinder us to scale forever, let's say, in a, in a very straightforward manner, what we call linear scaling. Some of the goals, of course, is to, uh, to be, let's say, uh, along the lines with linear scaling here and there, but we will also see that the realistics will really kick in in these HPC systems with the software running it with overheads we cannot really um, get rid of. So we talking about these things of showing them when we do weak scaling and strong scaling plots, usually in applications to show where are the limits and so on. And this is something what we will also have in the second part of the lecture with some examples. Then at the end, we will see today, we really are more hindered by Amdahl's law and we really then also reveal um, how we do performance analysis. Now, if you think about four processors, it's something we maybe can more or less manually, but uh, if you think about jewels and large systems, um, then you immediately can imagine that having this over 200,000 of cores and analysis in, in kind of, you know, kind of very manual sense doesn't make sense anymore. With this, we fulfill several, um, let's say, uh, already promises from earlier lectures, mostly one and two, where we do now much more in, in depth what really parallelization, performance, the terms related to this means. And as a conceptual lecture, it also has some formulas, but it will be the most formulas you will see in this course so far. And we will come back to some of the formulas in the physics later on in the applications. But here, these are, let's say, very fundamental aspects to understand a little bit conceptually more the speed up term. So, with this, you're then able to really think about um, the, the real importance that we have in domain decomposition HPC. It's a key ingredient. That's why we have it very early in the course. I just put MPI before so because I had wanted to hand out the assignment earlier based on our lessons learned from you know working with students over the last years. And normally, you really need to understand that first before you can go to parallel programming. 
because this is really where the parallel programming power comes in. And this is, of course, eminent in many of the different um, applications, but on different various levels, as you will see. There were different coarse grained grids and you know different types of trees to have a domain decomposition. We also think about that here the parallel computing has to be again done on various levels within a GPU and interconnecting GPUs. We will see that a little bit today in a video I have brought to you. But if you are really having done this lecture, you're really, let's say, prepared to have a distributed memory programming already on the basic level. You had all what you need, HPC, MPI, and then the knowledge of how to do something in parallel. So let's start with the first part, uh, really have having common strategies for parallelization. Of course, there are many strategies. Um, there are different ways how to do it, and I would not have any time here to go in all of these different directions. However, I come back to several applications that then pick another one and another one of this parallelization strategy so that we have a really applied way of learning this. So um, when we come back to parallel computing, I think the, the key essence really to understand and motivates why we do parallel computing is the idea of solving a problem really in a cooperative way. I want to use you know, the power of other processes to solve a very large process uh, of understanding, a large process of data analysis. So what's initially where serial, so just on one processor, um, basically with different threads maybe, is still you know, a kind of serial way of processing it. Why not using the power of different cores together? And that's what you already learned. That's the essence of high performance computing. And then when you put it really to the highest scale systems today, the biggest ones, you directly are in the top 500 list of the supercomputers. So this is really done today incredibly often, this power computing. But still, if you look what the basic building blocks are, you're back on our processes we know and we established on the lecture one. I think this is clear. I just brought that up again because you want to understand a little bit more law again. Thinking about, you remember, the motivation of basically going to the multi-core was that we cannot put more and more an increase in clock speed. So we cannot have the heartbeat of the processor higher and higher with this, you know, making more flops per second and have more computing power. Instead, we do more and more cores. Um, and these are not basically creating so much heat as, you know, just increasing the clock speed. However, of course, this has also several limitations. Still, you would say that these cores are high single thread performance, so they're very, let's say, tough cores, really number crunches you can apply to a problem. Of course, here you don't find them then in thousands or hundreds of the, uh, on the uh, chip. And we can use a multi-core processor um, when you basically think the first step of parallelizing something, and this would be a very simple parallel computing example, what you can imagine when we want to just find out here the, the maximum of all of these, um, basically that are inherent in an array maybe. Of course, more or less a toy problem here, but it captures the essence of the very simple data domain decomposition. You would have an array from zero till 15, and you usually would use there now your CPU or your core, and you know just have to look in serial through all of them. Um, and this is of course time it takes, it takes, it takes, it takes. Now, when you now think about that, when you would have four cores at your disposal, you could think about, uh -huh, I'm just interested in the maximum. So I can put the data to be computed on CPU core one, the other data here on core two and core three, and this reduces already the time, right? Because only now in parallel, I can say that, well, all these cores operate in parallel, they just have to identify and look through four elements of the array. Now, and then of course it's not very, let's say, um, uh, very complex to understand. I can quickly get the maximum. But of course, then we have something we call a local maximum. And this refers to many aspects in computing. This is just a local optimum in deep learning versus a global optimum in deep learning. Here we have, of course, just a local maximum of the array. And you need, however, then, when you have computed all of these four, uh, then of course someone who's telling you that the max global is then again the maximum from all of these locals. But this is something which could take, be taking, you know, just a very little time because again, you just take the maximum from four numbers. So in a hand, I guess it shows you a very nice example how you can speed up things. If you have, of course, then let's say 16 cores 
and you apply that you have just one each, it's hard to do actually the job because you will return back probably always 16. It shows you also that if you overdo it with too many cores uh, and throw it to a problem, maybe that doesn't really fit the application. All the cores are maybe sometimes idle, don't have to do anything anymore because it's just too much cores for a very trivial problem. So in this sense, um, this is the array idea here. Of course, we can think about there's much more interesting aspects of it. That's why I wanted to show you a little bit this. You know, these days we have now GP GPUs with really hundreds of cores, and they are, however, not the ones that we had seen before in the multi-core. They are much more lower in clock frequencies, they're just not that fast. But there are many and very many of them in order to solve a problem. And we want to see a little bit on the architecture here. Of course, think about we will have a complete lecture on deep learning. We have a complete lecture on lecture nine where we talk about GPUs really in detail. These are all things where we will reveal again the power of this GPU processors and the parallelization um, fundamental that goes with it, even including tensor cores, which are very advanced uh, cores just optimized for deep learning, again, leveraging a lot of parallelism and let's say a really base in parallelization, but really having fundamentals like throughput, scene, and so forth. So let's look a little bit at this video because it has some quite nice examples. Of course, it's again an NVIDIA video. However, um, take away the message, I'm not paid by NVIDIA. I just wanted to show you a very nice Volta GPU architecture and some application domains where this matter in order to do parallel computing. And then later on, you see some aspects within that I found quite nice in this particular short video. Predicting the Earth's most severe weather. Finally finding a cure for cancer. And developing more meaningful interactions with technology. These are some of the world's next great challenges. And solving them will require exponential growth in computing power. But the gap between CPU performance and the performance that Moore's Law promises continues to widen there was a need for a new, more powerful approach, GPU accelerated computing. The NVIDIA Volta GPU architecture is the next giant leap forward in computing performance. It employs over 21 billion transistors paired with second generation high bandwidth memory. Volta introduces new tensor cores designed to dramatically accelerate deep learning, delivering 125 teraflops of performance in a single GPU. With next-generation NVIDIA NV-Link for direct communication between GPUs, Volta is designed for strong scaling to achieve the highest application performance and ultimately save you money. It delivers breakthrough acceleration in over 500 HPC applications and all deep learning frameworks for both training and inference with TensorRT programmable inference acceleration. Volta powers the world's largest supercomputers, it is also being adopted by all leading cloud service providers and every major data center system manufacturer. This is the one unified computing architecture for HPC and AI, bringing solutions to the world's greatest challenges within reach. Learn more at nvidia.com slash Volta. All right, um, coming back to the lecture and sorry again for the marketing of NVIDIA, but we already discussed NVIDIA has quite a market share in the graphical chips. So there's no wonder that we basically again demonstrate this. However, the two takeaway message you hope maybe from this video mostly is firstly, there's this interesting Moore's law that we will come back to again with this kind of gap that the typical CPU, as I was mentioning, was basically not offering, let's say, the same performance increase every year. Um, so basically the GPU were then and actually filling this gap. But the second one is really the architecture you have seen. So you have seen also memory, this HBM we didn't really talk about. We will talk a little bit about this device memory and the aspects of it much more in lecture nine. You have seen that you can also put GPUs together basically in the rack. This was shortly there and you can interconnect GPUs with a so-called technology called NVLink. So you see also there in HPC GPUs have really become mainstream today. And this was already, of course, um, a success story, not only for AI, deep learning, also today in typical physics-based simulations, you find many packages have been 
ported already to the GPUs. And we will come back and come back to them when we basically then have the application examples. So, so much for the idea of a GPU. And when we now come back to the idea of the lecture, what is now the fundamental idea of using them in parallel? We have seen there are many, many, many cores on it. So why is it working so nice? And what is now the idea of doing this in parallel? I brought you an example, which is very easy to understand because there's a mathematical way how you would do, for instance, a matrix vector calculation. And the mathematical rule, I basically have colored here for you. So you essentially see something we call independent computing. You, if you remember a little bit about math, what you do is essentially just, you know, multiply these um, together here in the way when you say B is a matrix and C is a vector in a way that you just basically have put down here in more details. So you have the different single elements of this array always computed with your vector. Um, and then essentially this color code follows something we call independent computing. Independent means I don't need to know anything about the others. And this is a domain decomposition we're looking at here, right? So this is a matrix B, this whole thing. But my domain decomposition suggested I should put out vectors out of this. And the reason why I'm doing it is that the mathematical rule means I can independently computing the results with the different vectors following this mathematical rules for the matrix. And you, in a way, become parts, right? So the B part that I'm referring to here from the matrix is then always the one which is color coded and can nicely be parallelized if you see here with processor zero, processor one, processor two, processor three, and you go on. Of course, this is a very trivial example again, thinking about um, that this is just four. Uh, think about that you have lots of lots of cores in the tensor and in the tensors course, especially with those in the GPUs, of course. So you can have much more um, of a throughput there. If you do it too small, of course, it maybe doesn't make sense. But in other words, uh, you can have huge matrices here computed and multiplied very quickly in parallel with vectors. You can do matrix, matrix multiplication, things we also will learn more in deep learning. So and why are we doing this? But here, this is basically used incredibly often in science. You always have really computation, which is referring to matrix vector multiplications and so forth. And that's why also the NVIDIA GPU and other accelerators we will learn in lecture nine are very powerful to employ to this because they leverage this fundamental idea of parallelization, which is independence. This is a word that you need to be and know by heart still for the larger um, setup, of course, in the end, I want to have the whole vector again, right? So there needs to be some summarizing entity again. And the different application examples that you have, you just brought one, we will look into much more in detail in lecture 15, where it's about numerical weather prediction. So how we do the weather forecast with HPC. Um, this will be something very interesting. We use uh, basically numerics in order to have, you know, known physical laws. Uh, simulated over time. We predict the weather with this and we use basically lots of computing which is required for this ordinary and partial differential equations. So the change of the fundamental laws of physics, some call also for them um, the kind of uh, basically first order uh, things like uh, conservation of energy and so forth. So, um, but we will not talk about this here too much because we will come to this in different subsequent lectures what PDEs are. We will come back to that, what numerics are. So here the idea is more rather think about the domain decomposition. When you were basically to simulate the weather on Earth, you want to basically do this in parallel. You have to think and come up with a nice strategy to making this interesting blocks you think here. And these are different grids, so to speak, horizontal and vertical ones. We also saw in one of the earlier lectures examples in the videos of the Icon model, who is actually having a very interesting domain decomposition. We also come back later, but it's a more, let's say, um, advanced one that we will understand later. So this grid based domain decomposition and that you see essentially here again um, is, is something what you would also see, but it's not always one to one with a processor. It's also very interesting maybe for you to understand. So you can see here the processor decomposition follows another blockish 
worldwide fashion of always combining eight. So this means also they have a grid. The question is still how much of the grid is on what processor computed. And you see here the interesting color coding, which sheds you a quick you know, light on how you can actually have the same domain, like the 2D we have seen, we just put it in this vectorized form. You can have different vectors, column vectors. You can have different uh, blockwise ways, cyclic ones. So you see the way how you do this with the domain decomposition is, of course, a little bit derived from the problem you want to solve. In our way, it was a mathematical array. We wanted to have a matrix vector multiplication. That's why we took basically the vector form, because the mathematical principle said basically you can crunch it down in the vector and then compute it independently. But this is, of course, reflected in your parallel application usually. There are sometimes functional parallelism. We talk here about that essentially every processor is doing the same thing, but on a different domain. Could be the ocean, could be you no know, parts of Iceland to do the weather forecast. With functional parallelism, we will come back to this also when we have later models um, but we said in the groundwater model, I was alluding to as an example, right? We have different models on different layers, so to speak, on the earth and combining them maybe with the ocean model. Then when we had the coast with the sailing boat. So you see more and more complexity together and also not that these applications are doing the same thing. They compute different ways of physics, but interact heavily to actually exchange elements uh, that you can imagine are important to be realistic. So. Again, this brings us to kind of two really fundamental wordings. Um, we have seen the single program multiple data that you maybe want to apply over the grid of the Earth. And then you have the typical laws of physics there related to how you want to do this in over time simulation with maybe loops and domain decompositions that are really um, covering the Earth. But if you are in the multiple program multiple data, it's a little bit different. You would go rather to different schemes. You would have a master work scheme. Uh, we will come back to this shortly. We will have maybe something like different um, codes having basically the the human operating in the cockpit versus the tires actually hitting the road. But they still have to interact several aspects, like for instance, turning the, the wheel, of course, and things like that. So this is a different way of doing parallelization. When you think now about loops and medium grained loop and so on, this is just one example to think about why are loops so interesting for us in parallel computing. Um, this is by far because in a way what you do in a loop is again independent again and again, but of course it depends if you require, let's say, um, something which is constant like here, you see, uh, or if you basically have very dynamic entities. But you see here in this particular example, with a, let's say, pseudocode loop here, we just want to have basically a constant always, um, you know, multiplied with another array and then just iterate over all of them. And what immediately you will see is we, we don't need anything of the iteration before, which is a key thing in parallel computing to think about. Here, we just don't need this. It's completely independent from all steps before of us and back from us, uh, behind us. So here, what you could do in order to get a speed up to basically lower the time to solution, you just use two processors that work on different parts of the array. This is, of course, very nicely in shared memory. Uh, you can imagine this is often very quick to parallelize loops in shared memory. That's why we will talk in lecture six much about it, how actually this is supported in OpenMP. But this is just one example. Now, of course, when you do this in larger scales, like the world we had here again with the weather forecast, um, then it's not that simple anymore, right? So even if it's still iterative because you have a time scale, you want to know the weather over time, so we predict it over time, uh, what will happen in the next, let's say, 40, uh, 24 hours with the rain, with the, all the physics parameters. So here you need to have some, let's say, differences in the terms of independent from each other. They may be independent for a while, but have to exchange data significantly after every time step. And this is something where you can then define several domain name compositions. I think here it's pretty clear to think about how how different it would be if you just approximate maybe let's say the grid, which we would maybe could consider a little bit blockyish here. And you would say per block I have one item of data that represents the 3D grid decomposition, or you do a lattice, right? If you do a lattice, you see it's much more smoother in a way. 
um, that this lattice is covering and then approximates maybe the earth, let's say here the, the grass uh, much more closer than this blockish character. But probably means also more data items here and there, or basically also more time to computing. And in a way, it's again an application domain uh, problem, right, which you have to do it. And it's a way of actually how you maybe also have, you know, data to really initialize your applications. But these are more advanced topics. It just shows you that this domain decomposition is just not, not just any time, just this blockyish way that you would maybe think in the first place. There are much more advanced methods. And in later lectures, we will also learn something about adaptive mesh refinement, where the mesh basically is, or the lattice essentially here that you see here simulated, the smooth aspects are even put in down or cut in different pieces where it's much more compute intensive. There's a much more fine grained mesh uh, where lots of computing needs to be taking place and where not much computing takes place There's a coarse grained mesh. So uh, these are all more advanced topics we will not cover in this lecture today. Um, but another fundamental paradigm I want to bring across in the first part of the lecture here. And this is really thinking about the, the realistic aspect and that you could always maybe add more to be realistic. Think about when you want to essentially simulate the Earth here, very blockily with this kind of resolution. You can always think like a scientist wants to know more, engineering wants to know more. Think about it when you do a scientific domain study about the ocean going you know, with the waves. It's much more fine grained than doing this. You maybe want to add certain elements like rainfall, wind, oil, storms. Then you want to have other, let's say, aspects like the boats, fish. So let's say more operating in a very small scale um, in front of the coast of Iceland somewhere, birds, people. So the more you basically crunch down this granularity, you maybe can also add more details right, to the problem here. Um, otherwise, you see Iceland is almost not represented here. And over time, you maybe realize a little bit that this could be something like Iceland or not. Um, this is something to find out, right? Maybe I have to do much more, um, you know, basically domain decomposition and go much more into fine grained setups. Of course, here, the idea then remains that you still need the data from the processes which are next to me on the right and left for actually knowing something about the future. And of course, this on the terrestrial level, we will have in subsequent lectures here. I just wanted to show a little bit that the time plays a fundamental role as well not only in AI with training deep learning networks over time and break down the time. Also here, you have essentially a simulation of a race car going through the air. So you simulate over time. Here's an example of a heat dissipation, a heat map. So you basically want to understand the heat and actually after how it evolves after, let's say, a couple of times, They're doing more and more rounds. And there are physical codes which enable us to do so, but incredibly often, the next time step will be related to what happened before the last time step. A little bit like the location and what happened in the race car before the location in the last time step matters very much. Basically, what is the location now of my current time step? And this is something what we will come back to and come back to when we have really, let's say, physical applications where we look into power computing. We have so-called time steps like this Jacobi solver here that you see different domain decomposition again, including six neighbor cells or maybe much more in, you know, detail 26 neighbor cells. So that is also explaining how much compute we require, but also means how good could the model be in the approximation. If you have a room and you want to understand the heat dissipation, then you really um, can basically apply here different domain decomposition and you pay the price for the different computings, which also gives you more accuracy. However, it also shows you that over this time steps, um, you basically have your answer, but also that, of course, and this is a little bit what this should show you, although we have a complete lecture which have much more details on this, uh, will show you. Here you have a kind of isotropic lattice technique. Uh, even we go later on to something we call stencil methods, where we have a very principled parallel way of doing it. But that's what we will come back to with this particular application. Here it's just nicely also to see that when you want to compute something over this domain, which will be the heat dissipation here, what we see essentially with this over the different time steps, you always see, and you have to look particularly on this, that T0 and T1. So the, the values on the time step zero, 
will influence time step one. So we need to know what's happening on the neighboring cells, the time step before, in order to compute time step one. And this is a key paradigm, which is have, which seems logical to you, I guess, right? When we think about it, of course, the heat in the room depends on what the heat was before. And also the location of the race car or wherever you are in the world, the rainfall now has probably something a little bit related to what was the rainfall before. Of course, there are new elements of physics coming in, more wind, for instance, to the rainfall, influencing maybe how much water is over one tile in your domain. But this is still really an important part of it. So here you will find a little bit these kind of values. And in a moment, just think about that you have a certain n times n grid. And you would always update the physical variables and compute them in the certain time step. You have certain linear equations maybe to solve. And you do this in your certain time step. But you always have to make sure also to send essentially then those to the next time step or to make them available in the next time step. And this will lead us to some problems because if there's a course that you talked about when we say maybe domain one and domain two is on different cores, for instance, and you have this neighbor situation, you can imagine I don't have access to my neighbor. So we need, let's say, in the time step before to really think about strategies to copy essentially what I had at this time step already for the next time step to compute it essentially via so-called halo and ghost layers. These capture essentially something which you don't see and which we have to take care of to really enable that this kind of simulations that look so nice and smoothly among all the processes are really that way. Because if you remember, we cannot have access to the memory. Before that, we have to do the send and receive, the collective operations, whatever it is to really access then the, the different aspects that we have here that could be an ocean, the height of waves. I need this to compute the next basically height of the waves for this particular tile, including all the ones of my neighbors. But for this, I really have to have some domain idea. And also on top, I, as a developer, or basically, I have to define what we will do there. And this can affect different parts of computing, basically. And you see here, one of it is really the cost of how much goes through the network. You would say it's really the same grid here. And depending on how you pick your domain decomposition, from the same grid here, you have actually different costs of communication interchange. You could have this vector forum here where we have this interesting halo layers where we always have to exchange physical variables. This is three times 16 essentially, if you see, which makes 48 essentially of costs of data I need to ship. And then you think, okay, when I do this blocky character, it's the same, this still the same idea, but you immediately if you look and count, you will see, oh, it's indeed much less to compute, uh, basically, and to bring over by this data. Because here the ghost cells are directly, let's say, encapsulating these blocks. And with this, you have less, basically, what you have to transfer over to the other processor domain. And we will come back to this again and again. I finish here the first part of this lecture now really with the idea of thinking about that this is a problem we come back to in lecture 10, especially also for um, then uh, the the field of data parallelism. We have here an idea where lots of data is on this side, so it could be tackled with one processor, and then another process is taking care of the other parts, which is actually not so crowded in terms of data items, alluding to some of the problems we will come back to called load imbalance, right? And of course, for this, this is what I wanted to show here. Here, we need also halo layers. If you want to cluster this together, and to identify if this forms a cluster, but essentially we're here already in the other processor, we need some information about the data already during the clustering step at that time. What would be the data items if I move to the other processor? Because I cannot access the memory, I don't know that. Still, we are able to scale, if you see, by using such hollow methods and essentially these ghost cells. Then the master worker scheme a little bit. Um, I think we have uh, seen this already a little bit, alluding to some of the applications here. You would think like even if you do, let's say, the max global of an array, um, you need to go to the locals back to really identify it. So there must be someone who taking a little bit like rank zero, maybe the master often actually makes a final computation of saying all from the locals, the maximum of the oldest locals is this particular global one. 
This is something we call the master worker paradigm, for instance, where this big problem that this master would have is chunked down into the different workers, and sometimes the master would work basically also for it. Some of you are basically a bit older know also it was called the master slave paradigm. In, in the light of the world today we have, we basically don't want to use this term anymore. We use a master worker paradigm. So, and with this, you have different ways how you do tangential decomposition. You have different ways how you do domain decomposition. We come back to this again and again in different ways how we do it. Also in computational fluid dynamics, this will be a very interesting thing, not only for the race car, also if you want to have really liquid flow, fluid flow, um, their domain decomposition, of course, plays a ro huge role as well. But we will come to this in the subsequent lectures. So let's have this video because it nicely summarizes a little bit what I was saying. And then we stop here with the first part of the lecture. So this was a remarkable video, in my opinion. So it shows you really how beautiful science and engineering can be, if you want, with having really nice and powerful visualizations. But of course, behind these visualizations you have seen, like here, the ash cloud that came from Ayafjatya Yukut, our volcano in Iceland. This is, of course, really physics behind it. So lots of computing that calculates the positions of the particles of the ash for the next time step and for the next time step. So this iteration I was saying is essentially inherent in everything you have seen on this examples, let it be from engineering and the ship over the ocean, basically also including the aspects of track design and also here the ash cloud. But that's all I wanted to present to you today in this first part of the lecture. We come back to this with a more conceptual idea about parallelization, the second part. <laughs>